So the next method that we're going to talk about is k-means, which is really probably the most famous um, clustering approach, partitional approaches. Um, does not have that property, so it means you have to specify the k up front, um, which makes it a bit harder. So it seems similar to what we were talking about before. Um, we're trying to minimize um, some score of the clustering, but the way that we can assign points doesn't just have to be um, hierarchical, where we're splitting or um, growing them directly. We could just move points from one cluster to another. So once we let ourselves say that um, these sets are kind of like um, almost like random access, you can just assign points to them, um, it frees us up to have a much kind of simpler and more powerful algorithm, although we do have to now specify k up front, which is a bit of a problem. Um, so uh, it's not a, a convex optimization problem because we don't know the shape of the data necessarily ahead of time. Um, so it's a very large space. Coming up with the optimal partition, obviously, basically all it's saying is coming up with the optimal partition of points that maximizes some kind of um, objective is going to be very hard um, based on the data size. But if we do an approximation that's reasonable, um, we can we can do quite well. So k-means is this one that's kind of very intuitive, but um, works well. So we, like we said, initially we're given um, the k. So we say let's let's learn um, three clusters of data points. So we're going to say k equals three, and um, we're basically going to initialize these points randomly, right? So um, we're going to pick uh, k of the points from x, right? So these are actually sampled from x n, um, all the data points. Um, we just pick k points and make those the centers. And that's for our initial, um, our initial set of centers. But these will be wrong, right? Um, and then what we do is we basically say, and I should clean up the math on this, just because we're using PowerPoint for this deck, um, is that a point belongs to um, a set if it's by basically being closest to its, um, its mean, right? So we have a bunch of cluster representations. We have the mean, right? So like I was saying before, we have um, a point in space which is the mean of all the points in that cluster and so initially we have these ones and we'd say for for um, point xj um, we want to find the distance from xj to all of the means and we want to put it in the class that it has the lowest one right so if x is in um, some class um, w that's because um, class w is the one it's closest to right um, and so we initialize all the data points to be in the cluster that has the mean that they're closest to. And then we compute new clusters based on those new means, sorry, um, new cluster centers or, or means, um, right, means as in just the average, um, using the current membership, right, and then repeat, right. So it's like the simplest algorithm um, you can think of. Um, and I don't know if you guys can see all the color here on your, your screen that well. Maybe I'll even zoom in a bit now for this one. Um, just to kind of like initialize it for your eyes or your screen. Uh, these data points are green circles. Uh, these data points are orange circles. And these data points are purple circles. Um, so and see if people believe them. So that's my clustering, but I'm a human with millions of years of evolution in my brain, and that's not fair, right? So what does the algorithm do? Um, K-means picks some point. It says initializes um, some points here. I said you pick an individual, one of the actual points in the data set. Um, in this setup, I don't remember where I got these images from. Um, if we ran it, it might adjust initially. Another way to do that would be to initially assign all data points, you know, to some set, and then um, give uh, it a data points. Oh, no, wait, I'm wrong, right? Because in the next slide, those do exist. OK, great. So it's exactly what I said before. Um, <laughs> now I've messed it up. So. Um, the initial means um, that we're talking about and on the first round 
were particular data points, right? So we picked some data points and they said, we said, okay, this is the means. And then in order to determine if it was in some class or not, we uh, we assigned it to the closest one, right? So these guys were the closest. And so that's how they were set. So these are the clusters that the algorithm came up with based on the first set. Um, and these being closer, right? And what you're testing the distance is obviously is the distance to that point versus the distance to that point, right? And this one won out. Um, so that's the initial one. But then once we have these, we basically are gonna throw away these initial means, they're not meaningful. But once we have an initial set of uh, points, we find the means of those and compute them and that becomes our new centroids. And so now in the new set, we have those ones that we computed as means uh, before, right? And this is step two. Um, this one was step one. I should have a title on this slide, I'm realizing. Um, now we're using those means we already computed and we recompute everybody's distances, right? And so um, if I unmaximize my one under the screen, Um, these data points changed. What are some other interesting ones that changed? I should determine this beforehand. Oh, okay. These ones all changed. So um, from the, uh, come on, sorry. It jumped ahead. All right, so in step two here. Um, so from the previous slide, um, these ones changed because initially these these guys were um, you know set to some some data points because they were closest to the means they had, but now with the new ones they're all closest to this orange one in the bottom left, and so now they're in this class, right? Um, but obviously they're part of the current model thinks they're part of this larger class uh, which contains all of these, and my pen is too sensitive, right? Um, but again, this isn't necessarily the best model. And so now once given these points, we compute new means for the existing points using the existing clusters and we keep going, right? So if we watch the, um, sorry, so the reload doesn't work that well as an animation, we can find this after. The um, crosses kind of move to different locations. Um, and at some point they, uh, they stop moving very much. So you can see how much it moved that way. The previous time it moved even further. Um, this time now it's moved even even less, right? So um, by the end it, it converges and they stop moving and it basically gives you the same point again on some of them. And then that's how you know you can stop. I've lost the purple one, I guess it's here. I think there's one more, right? Um, and so you just keep doing that until basically uh, the you can have some criteria for stopping, but once the uh, the means basically finish their journey um, and they've taken a lot of steps, they will stop moving, right? Because eventually these points are the means, and nothing else has to split, and it's essentially now come up with a dividing line like this for the data points, which is a perfectly good clustering. Um, this set of points are not really clear what the right answer should be. So there's other ones you could argue, but that's not a bad one, right? Because the distances here, if you think about the intercluster distances, whether you're using single link or um, complete link, there's a fairly large gap here. Um, here it's quite close. So you could argue that there could be some other split, but you were told you had to have three, right? So that's the other constraint. We said three. And so what other three would you pick, right? Um, I guess you could pick this one. That might not be bad. Um, but then you could run it again, right? So the, one of the, the things with this is that um, the starting point matters, right? So the initial um, random points that you picked could affect the way it progresses because they're just going to move essentially locally by gathering their friends around them and recomputing the mean. So if you try again with a different set of starting points, you might get a different answer. And so a good thing to do with this is to basically rerun it a bunch of times 
with different random starts and then um, maybe average them together or vote on, on the clusters and try to figure out um, how often our data points in the same cluster or not. Because they won't converge to the same thing. Um, so how do you know to stop? Um, right, convergence, we're saying like, when should we stop? Um, the, the, the simplest way is to say, um, the means stop moving. So once the change in the centers of the means doesn't get updated, once the updating is below um, some epsilon um, that you can specify, then you can stop, right? Um, if you have you have your objective function that says um, you're scoring, say the complete link um, distance between all the points, you could have that and just keep adding it up on all the clusters. And then once it gets below some, some um, epsilon, you stop. That's a different way to do it. Um, or you could do it by re reassignment, right? So maybe the mean is still moving, but data points haven't changed, right? Because once um, once the data points don't change anymore, um, they're never going to change again, right? Because the mean is, is going to be the same, and it's going to stop moving, right? So if, um, if reassignment, um, right, so assigning some xj um, gets moved from cluster, you know, one, um, and it gets moved to cluster uh, two instead. That's a reassignment. If if uh, if the number of reassignments is um, is is zero across all of them, then you're definitely done, right? Because the means will never change again, right? So on the extreme, when the number of reassignments is zero, you have to stop. There's no point. But you could all just say like, well, if there's only like two or three points changing to another class and I've got thousands and millions of points, then you could just stop because it doesn't matter anymore. Um, okay, so does that make sense? Again, it's a pretty simple algorithm, um, but um, it's very powerful. And if you're ever doing clustering or you just want to understand your data and figure out what kind of group picks there are, you can run k-means on it. It is um, a little bit faster than um, the other uh, hierarchical algorithms we're talking about but it's still not super cheap if you have a very large um, amount of data. Um, so um, in terms of trying to look at the um, complexity of this, the complexity of the standard um, k-means um, is uh, OTKN. So N is the number of data points. K is the number of clusters you have because you do have to compute distances, so points within all the points in the cluster and compute those means, right? And then the number of times you run it is is the complexity as well. And this you could say, I'm only going to run it 100 steps or 10 steps, or you could wait until some threshold. So you don't exactly know the complexity, but it's at least it's not n squared, right? And so long as your number of clusters is much less than the data, which is normal, um, it should be faster than a hierarchical approach. Um, it's going to be, it has no guarantee of local optim optima, so it's a local minimization algorithm. You might get stuck in something bad, so it's good to rerun it. Um, and it's sensitive to this first step of this random choice of the centers, so um, rerunning it uh, is useful um, and, and getting the answers. And it's also sensitive to outliers, right? Um, if you think about this here and we say now suddenly, like not suddenly, but like we had this data point and we understand how it works here, but what if there was also one other data point out here, right? Um, this might help, but it might also be, maybe that's not a good example. Like right here on the line, it's definitely gonna change it because it um, its line now can't be the same. Sorry, I don't know if this line was, if I can get rid of a line, I'll get rid of it after. Um, what would be the effect of having this additional point, right? Because it's about a mean, um, once whichever class uh, this uh, point is put into, it's gonna affect that mean a lot, right? It's gonna move it. And so um, since you're just using mean, it, um, it's pretty sensitive to outliers. Obviously you can, you can um, update that in the way, the same way you do it with a lot of other things um, by not using the mean, but using um, like the median or something like that. Oh, we have a slide on sensitivity. So let me look at the questions here. Um,
Okay, so some good questions there. Um, so just to finish that outlier idea, what comes next? Oh, right, I forgot about that part. Um, that your, uh, well, yeah, I drew it for no reason. I had a slide showing this. Um, the outlier would move the mean quite a lot, right? So um, one way to do it um, is to use K modes, right? Where um, instead of using the, come on, instead of using the, the median, um, you, sorry, instead of using the mean, you could use the median um, or something else instead of mean, and then that's gonna be a little less sensitive to um, the mode, so you're gonna pick a, a data point in the set rather than the actual center point um, mathematically. Um, but then as, um, as we're saying, it's kind of sensitive to this first step, so uh, Sangara follows up on the question about um, unsupervised and semi-supervised. Um, we are giving it um, K, so that I guess in a way you could call that semi-supervised, that we're given one piece of information, but it's still even just a guess, so it's really a parameter of the algorithm. So if you think of this just as a parameter that helps you fit um, what you're doing, I mean, when we have a parametric system and we're saying, okay, we're going to assume that they're Gaussian, but learn within that. So in that sense, we are putting some information into it. Um, there's no such thing as giving no information about the data because we have the data itself and we have an algorithm. Um, so yeah, just having one parameter like this, like the number of classes or a, a distribution, and we don't even know if it's the right one, isn't considered making it semi-supervised. You could still be unsupervised. Semi-supervised would be more like, okay, here's some points and I know they're actually in the same class. Not even what the class is, but I know these, this 10% of the data, I know that they're in the same class. Um, and so you could use that as an anchor to build on, right? Um, so these kind of par parameters are not necessarily enough to really consider it semi-supervised. Um, Sophia has a good question about um, if you start off with really bad points, right? So if we started here, um, what if our initial, I'll go back to the first one, I guess. Um, well, the second one's cleaner. Um, no. So what if our first, our first um, anchor points what did we do? We started here and here, but what if we just picked these two guys, right, as our first two points? Um, what would happen, right? We're still required um, to say that uh, data points are in um, different classes. So if I use a cleaner set here, let's say we say these are our, our initial data points where these ones, the ones that I'm coloring, you still would have to come up with the closest points to them. Um, and so it's not magic, but um, definitely, um, you'd still get a class of, of points that are in, sorry, a clustering of points that are in um, one of them versus the other, right? Um, because even though they're close to each other, some points are still closer to it than the other one, and that will define the cluster. So you'd still get ones, it wouldn't be very good, and very quickly then the new means of these would be here, and you'd get the same. So it would, it would diverge. It doesn't matter if the, the starting points are bad, as long as they're different, they can't be the exact same points, that should not be allowed. So when you sample um, your starting points, they should be with um, without replacement, that's very important. Um, or you just pick random points in the space, you don't even have to pick actual data points, right? You could pick just random points out in the middle of nowhere as your starting points if you want. But then you might pick a point out here, um, and it'll, it'll take you a long time to converge. So you're right, um, people's answers in the chats, like it'll just take longer to converge, but it will still converge to something. There's theoretical like proofs to talk about that this will definitely converge to something. Um, it's just no guarantee if it's any good, um, but it will stop eventually because um, the data is fixed and there's only so many. Um, computing the mean of something is reductive. So law of large, large numbers means you're still gonna get um, a, every time the distance is going to be smaller. The chain, the update in the means is going to get smaller each time and so eventually it will converge to zero. But there's no need to keep running it until actual zero. Um, you can set a, th a threshold to be something smaller. All right, so we've talked about pros and cons. It's simple, it's fast. Um, if your data is not too high uh, dimensional, um, right? Why dimensionality is in here, there's just a number of patterns, but it's not very good for high dimensional data um, because distances in high dimensions are weird. If you think about, you know, what's your distance between two points on the surface of the earth versus your distance in space versus your distance in like hundred dimensional something. Um, 
data points tend to have large large distances or similar distances from each other the more dimensions you add um, because they're just spread out right so um, it's harder and harder if you have lots of dimensions um, and it's not good outliers because that will shift the mean across to somewhere else.